shit. So Phantasm, when did you first see it? Uh, I guess I saw it a, a year or two after it came out. I think it was originally shot in 76 or 77, and then it was released in 79, because they, were, they apparently had some uh, time that they had to spend looking for a distributor. I guess they eventually got uh, AFCO Embassy to pick it up. But anyway, they, they put it out in 79, and I seem to remember seeing this in the theaters uh, when I was in my one and only year of college. I went, I was not interested in it because at that time in my life, I wasn't really particularly interested in horror movies, but I had a friend in college who spent all of his time in his apartment, sitting around smoking pot and blasting the Phantasm <laughs> soundtrack, which he had on vinyl. And the, the score was done by um, Fred Myron. It's also, a great score. It's a great, a great score. score. I love yeah, it. Yeah. It really is terrific uh, and enormously important in the success of the movie, I think. Uh, and he, uh, he apparently was influenced by Goblin and um, Mike Oldfield, the guy who did Tubular Bells, yeah. uh, Exorcist. Uh, anyway, my friend said, oh, you got to come and see us playing at the theater in Times Square. Actually, it might have been the Africa Embassy Theater. I think there used to be one in Times Square. Uh, so I sort of grudgingly went, and then I just thought it was terrific. I enjoyed it very much. And um, how about you? When did you first see it? Uh, probably it would have been when it came out on VHS, whatever year that would have been, probably early 80s. Right. But yeah, thinking about it coming out in 79 with them filming it in 70, what did you say? Seven, they were filming it in 76? 76, 77. Uh, they said they it took a year to film. Yeah, because well, because my big question is, uh, did George Lucas steal the Jawas? No, that's that's the... an interesting thing. You know, <laughs> I spent about a half hour this afternoon <laughs> listing all the similarities to Star Wars that I saw in the yeah. It turns out the movie was sixty percent finished by the time they even heard of Star Wars. Star Wars, yeah, that's a. I mean, like I said, it comes out in seventy nine, but you you know, you think about well, they he wrote it probably before that and. Well, it is an extraordinary thing because it's not just the Jawas. I mean, obviously, yeah. and apparently uh, while they were working on uh, the film, uh, somebody saw the trailer for Star Wars when the first trailer was released. They saw the Jawas in the trailer and, they, and everybody was in a panic saying, oh, my God, are we going to have to reshoot? <laughs> you know? But the similarities to Star Wars include uh, the fellow that plays Jody, who certainly looks like somebody that was cast because of his resemblance to Harrison Ford, even the character that he's playing with his uh, Cuda standing in for the Millennium Falcon. Right, you know. yeah. And uh, the, uh, the fellow that plays Mike, uh, he is very close in character to Mark Hamill. Same sort of young, innocent, naive uh, kid, you know, going through rites of passage, that sort of thing. Yeah. Very similar to like Luke Skywalker. But then there's also, well, there's a there's a cantina in this film. Yeah. <laughs> Dune's cantina, similar to, uh, to uh, Moss Eisley cantina. And uh, there's the silver ball, which is similar to, you could take your pick, either the uh, interrogation droid that comes in to give a hypo to Princess right, Leia, yeah. or the training droid that looks kind of Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that one, yeah. But anyway, so, so is Reggie Bannister, is his character uh, Obi-Wan or Chewbacca? <laughs> yeah, we really can't figure out what he would be. He probably would have to be Obi-Wan, although he doesn't really uh, fit the Obi-Wan uh, character. You could say that the tall man is Darth Vader, right? That's yeah. It. But it turns out Gus Corelli wasn't. Uh, uh, oh, I should also mention that just like with Luke, who suffers the loss of his parents, this these this guy is also uh, he just lost his parents, parents two years yeah. ago. Yeah, uh, Coscarelli apparently got the original idea to do this 
because him and Reggie Bannister were talking about trying to get the rights to do an adaptation of Ray Bradbury's Something Wicked This Way Comes. And I could see that, the right, similarities, yeah. the sort of Halloweenish or autumnal quality that the film has uh, is very much like what you would expect from a film adaptation of Something Wicked. Uh, he also says he was inspired to a certain extent by Invaders from Mars, which was a film that was done by William Cameron Menzies. That's the one about the kid that sees the aliens crash land and he can't convince his family or the, the townspeople that the aliens are taking over. His father gets taken over, he goes out to see what it is and he gets taken over by the aliens and they all have a little mark on their neck. Anyway, similarities to Phantasm are pretty clear there as well. The kid trying to you know, grapple with uh, adults that won't believe him. I'm the same age as the fellow that plays uh, Michael. A Michael Baldwin, I guess is his name. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, uh, today is his birthday, by the way, as we shoot. Yeah, this. I saw that. Yeah, I was going to say. Today mm -hmm. is his birthday. Uh, and I had, I had a, a sympathy with that character because when I first saw this, it was just a few years on from that time. And just like scenes in this film where he's sort of aimlessly wandering around the streets, um, you know, and that reminds me of myself at that age. Yeah. So I, I had a certain connection to that character and the situation that he found himself in, uh, sort of you know, fearing and also anticipating all the things that would come with adulthood, uh, you know, fearing adults. Uh, the tall man sort of represents uh, adults, big, tall, towering figure, you know. Uh, scowling all the time and, and growling. The funeral is about to begin, sir. Uh, and he also represents death. I mean, he's a mortician. That's another thing that apparently Cascarelli was inspired by when he was thinking about what type of horror movie he wanted to make. Apparently the idea of doing something about morticians or the uh, uh, mortician business uh, appealed to him because, you know, it's it's kind of a spooky line of work, right? Uh, everybody wears black and they get to monkey around with bodies behind, yeah. <laughs> behind the scenes. So it was actually a perfect idea for a, for a horror movie. Uh, but beyond just sort of being in, in sympathy with uh, the character, uh, uh, I also just got a kick out of it because it's such a crazy fucking movie. You know? Yeah. What I like about the first film and what I sort of sort of makes me less fond of the sequels is that the first film, you saw with a, a real world environment. We understand that world. We can see ourselves in that world. Yeah, and, relatable character. The characters were really relatable. Right, yes. And uh, as things go on, little mysterious things start to happen. And we don't need to know why they're happening. We don't need an explanation as we go along because that's part of following a mystery, right? You don't yeah. know why these things are happening. So we're willing to accept without explanation all the little strange, mysterious things because we're assuming that at some point all of this is going to be explained. And it is kind of, it's not really a very logical explanation. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem with the sequels is they start with the inexplicable or bizarre or mysterious things. And they, like right from the second film, they're going through all these uh, convolutions to try to uh, explain why the girl uh, he has a psychic connection with is involved. Right, yeah. Well, that's sort of confusing stuff. And also, uh, Cascarelli's uh, love for reversals, like having uh, leading you to believe something is happening and then say, oh, no, that, that didn't happen. That was just in their minds or that was just a dream. Right, yeah. It was a dream, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he does it in Phantasm at the end where it's, it was all a dream. No, it wasn't. Uh, right. so, and that's fun because it sends the audience out with a little kicker at the end. Yeah, plus yeah. he wasn't, I don't think he was planning on a sequel. So the, fir the first one was just an end, just I just have a mind. Yeah, <laughs> and it's similar to a lot of movies that were being made at the time that ha did a similar thing. Uh, the Fog has a similar end where you think it's yeah. over. And then Carrie, of course, has the famous scene with the hand jump, you know, shooting up from the grave. Uh, and so it's kind of fun because it doesn't really affect the story that's uh, that you've enjoyed up to that point. Yeah, It's just a little way for the storyteller to say, we're not taking this that seriously. Uh, right, know? yeah. One, one last jump scare before right. you leave the theater. Exactly. <laughs> and and I, I should say that the first film does grapple with some serious issues, right? I mean, it's about uh, loss of your parents and, and uh, the fear that kids might have that they're going to be abandoned. 
Right, yeah, his brother's getting older and going to move away and leave right. him there, yeah. And if you, you could very easily look at the first film as just sort of like a, a fantasy in the mind of this kid who's anxious about being abandoned, uh, still mourning the loss of his parents, uncertain of where he fits in in the world. Uh, so it has certain serious things underpinning it, but it's still just a wacky, fun movie. Uh, it's the sort of movie that a kid that age might make you know it has that sort of uh anything can happen uh quality to it first time i watched it i was enjoying it uh, up to the point where a finger turns into a bug a fly, yeah gets stuck in his hair <laughs> Then I said to myself, oh, I love this movie. <laughs> yeah. you know, any movie that has a red-eyed bug flying around, you know, uh, that's when the whole thing just becomes delightful and, and you know, and really is endearing, uh, I think, to the audience in a way that probably they could never have imagined it would be when they were doing it. Right? Yeah. They were just sort of throwing stuff up against the wall. Apparently, the movie was shot over the course of a year on weekends because you could get a free day if you rent the equipment on the weekend. Yeah. Uh, so that's a technique I guess you use if you're trying to save money, but um, uh, shooting uh, on weekends over the course of a year means that they were able to keep coming up with different ideas and changing course and doing different things. And apparently they ended up with like a three hour uh, rough cut. Uh, and a lot of that was edited down, it was, uh, you know, I, I had more than an, an hour was yeah. taken out. And that's another thing I like about this movie is that it's very clearly an edited film. It's not one of those films where they just sort of assembled the footage and put it out. Right. It's clear that they were thinking very carefully about how they could compress scenes and keep the pace up. And there's a lot of instances in the film where you see them using little editing tricks. Like for instance, when they're standing by the casket, uh, Reggie and Jody are standing by the casket looking at Tommy's body in the coffin. Mm -hmm. And you hear their conversation, and actually the conversation starts over the, first, the earlier shot, which is of the mausoleum, or it's over the, uh, the ceremony, I guess. Uh, yeah. When they cut to them, they're not saying anything. They're not, yeah. Hey, it was a good idea not to let your little brother come to the funeral and see Tommy like this. Yeah, after mom and dad's funeral, he had nightmares for weeks. Yeah, I noticed there was a lot of a lot of scenes like that where it was right. dialogue over top of almost B-roll, <laughs> B-roll right. footage. Right. Yeah. And it's a brilliant way to move things along because yeah. you get the impression while you're watching it that you actually saw them saying those things, but you didn't. <laughs> yeah. The same thing like later when they're leaving the mausoleum and there's a very brief shot of them, Reggie and, and Jody, walking across the lawn and Jody starts to say something and they immediately cut to a shot of the... Uh, the cooter driving away from the from the mausoleum and yeah. you hear the conversation over that shot hey i don't like this place well say goodbye to tommy let's just get the hell out of here so you would get the impression that you saw a scene with jody and reggie talking saying those things but you didn't they weren't wasting time with unnecessary stuff Apparently they shot a lot of unnecessary stuff, but they were smart enough to go back and chop all of that. And take it out, yeah, yeah. Back when we were talking about uh, <laughs> Plan Nine from Outer Space, I was talking about how uh, the character dies next, and that next scene's their funeral. <laughs> and I was right. like, and it's like no time. They done the same thing in this movie, but it worked. Yeah, it works. The guy at the beginning works. gets killed by the by the girl. Next scene is them at the funeral, <laughs> and just a little dialogue. That, that scene with Jody and Reggie standing yep. in front of the mausoleum, that's enough just for them to say, uh, they, they tell you why they're there. Yep. And, and the Reggie guy says, the yeah. guy, guy died <laughs> and he killed himself apparently, right? Jody. Hi, Reg. How's it going? Tommy's gone. It's, uh, it's 
It's a hell of a way to end a trio. <laughs> it's hard to believe. I killed himself. Hey, I, uh, I'm gonna go visit somebody. Uh, I'll catch you inside. Yeah. Or the economy of it. Like, for instance, they didn't really shoot, as far as I know, in a real mausoleum. Yeah. That mausoleum was a set with contact paper on wood uh, to simulate the marble. Uh, so I had that shot of the two of them standing in front of that mansion. And that mansion actually was used in um, A View to a Kill and in mm -hmm. Burnt Offerings. So it's a frequently used mansion. They shot in California. Even though the story was set in Oregon, they shot in California. So they just have that shot of the mansion and just a couple of scenes where people are actually standing in front of them. And they sprinkle that into the movie and it gives you the impression that a lot of the movie actually takes place there. Yeah, it, they, it, they even rides a bike up. To, rides, riding the bike, it, yeah. right. But the fact that they were able to give you the impression of this much larger world, even though if you actually go scene by scene and look at the shots, it's very narrow, very narrowly focused, right? Yeah. Uh, there's so few characters in this when you stop and think about it, so few speaking parts. And yet you have the impression that there's a whole town there. And so there's a, a sense of a larger world that the whole thing is taking place in. And that's, uh, I think, largely attributable to the cleverness of the editing. They just give what a little few lines of dialogue that give us an idea of what we're supposed to believe is happening. Uh, and even at, they even have some scenes where the screen goes black and you just hear the dialogue over the last Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm pretty sure when he, when he goes into the bar the first time, like I'm remembering it was a full bar, but I don't think it was. I'm imagining like an entire, That's you it. know, <laughs> full bar, but it they, wasn't. They shot it in such a way so that you give the, you're given the impression, probably based on your experience in watching similar movies. You know, when you see a scene like that, you're probably going to see people in the background. There are some things that become truncated too much and uh, they sort of lose the, the meaning or logic. Like for instance, uh, after he goes to the fortune teller, uh, he has that little session, which is very effective, that scene with the mm -hmm. fortune teller and him having that uh, trust test of putting right. his hand in the box. Put your hand in the box. Well, what's in it? Just put your hand in the black box. Okay, but what's in it? Hey, this thing really hurts. Don't fear, Michael. I've seen that somewhere else too. That was uh that was in Dune. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, where he puts oh, his hand in the box to <laughs> Well if that's if it's in the book, then that may be where he got the idea. Yeah. But uh the girl, the granddaughter, I assume it's her that we see from behind going to Going back to the yeah. And there's a shot of her in the mausoleum set approaching the door where in the white where the right room is she opens the door and they cut away and you hear a scream. Yeah. So anytime you see a scene cut that, that way, that means that that wasn't the way it was shot. Right. <laughs> there was some big thing that was cut out and uh, they solved the problem uh, of what happened to her just by having her scream. So the audience assumes you put she's that over dead. the side, yeah. so she's out of the picture. But I don't really understand, because I don't know what they cut out. I don't really understand why she's there in the first place. Yeah, I don't know. And then there's other little things like there's a moment in the, when he's riding his dirt bike around the cemetery, where there's a sudden sound, it almost sounds like an explosion and he's thrown off the bike. Right. And they have a quick cut of Angus Scrim looking over like he was responsible for that. I assume that's something that was put together in the edit. Put editing. together, yeah. He fell off his bike in some scene, and I guess they thought, well, we don't want to cut that out because that's like production value. That's a stunt. So let's try to tie it in with the story that we're telling by having Angus Scrim a close-up of him so it looks like he's present and witnessing this and that maybe he had some sort of effect uh used this telepathic power yeah. which doesn't appear anywhere <laughs> else in the movie but uh i suppose i'd have to say that i'm not really that impressed by the climactic scene when they dispatch uh the tall man uh, because the idea late in the movie of suddenly deciding that there's a mine shaft somewhere uh and coming up with the idea that you could somehow lure him out there and get him to fall down a hole, that's kind of a stretch. Yeah. Uh, first of all, there's no reason if, they, if he's a supernatural being uh, or a science fictional being, an alien of some kind, there's no reason to believe that 
that would be effective, right? Killing him by just throwing him down a hole might not work. Uh, and of course, as we le learned in the sequels, it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, but and they never that, mentioned the mind before that, so right. It's just kind of like of, eh, just... <laughs> they didn't have an ending in mind apparently when they were working on the film, and I guess they just sort of pulled that out of the air. Right. I honestly can't think of a better ending, but uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the ending is satisfactory in the sense that the movie has to end at some point, and that's as good an ending as anything else. Yeah, <laughs> it's enjoyable enough up to that point, so that doesn't really, it's not really a, a problem. And of course, if we see the whole thing as just a sort of fantasy in the mind of a boy, then you know, that, what difference does it make if it's logical? Or, yeah, so but it's a movie that I think. Probably for me and for a lot of other people, we have much greater affection for it than it probably really merits. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Don Cascarelli is a, is a smart guy and I think he's a talented filmmaker and he's done some great movies. Uh, but it's not a perfect film by any means. It's just some, something about it. There's a, a time and a place and a feeling that it evokes. And uh, people my age, at least, uh, uh, are, are sort of captured by it. Yeah, I've always liked. I mean, it's always been one of my favorites. I've always liked it. The uh, the idea of like the the way they're doing the. I guess it's a parallel universe. I know they go into it in the later movies, which I don't really care for. I like the yeah. ambiguity of like what is going on here, you know, because they actually show where that portal goes to, and I like the idea of that portal just being the two poles. They tied in with the tuning forks, you know, early on. I was like, oh, that's that's like a cool idea that you you know you don't see anybody else do. And I thought that was a good. Yeah, uh, it's another thing that sort of works on a dream level. Yeah, it's a dream logic. Uh, I don't know why a tuning fork would be particularly useful in a situation like that, but <laughs> you know, it, visually it certainly works. And, and yeah. uh, you know, the fact that the guy is, you know, a musician, he happens to have a tuning fork, so you know, it's it sort of ties all of that stuff. And in. he has the right note. And he has <laughs> just the tuning the right forks coming in the different, yeah. <laughs> but the uh, all a lot of those things, like the silver spheres, uh, I was surprised in watching it this time. I, I watched it like a day or two ago. How abrupt their appearance is. Yeah. Uh, and there's no explanation and everybody as with every other phenomenon in the movie they almost immediately accept whatever is going on <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, like the scene when reggie comes upon them when they're struggling with the bug trying to force it down the drain uh, the garbage disposal on that side and the ice cream is going to be flying fast and furious Remember how good you were at crowd control last time? Hey, what's going on here? I was afraid that there would be a long scene there where they would explain all the stuff that had happened. But no, yeah. <laughs> Reggie's, no. <laughs> you know, you want to go and kill the guy at the mortician at the mausoleum? Sure, I'm down. The one really admirable quality about sequels is that even though they don't work that well, uh, they didn't give up that sort of crazy approach to things. Uh, they're completely unpredictable and, and the plots are uh, inexplicable. Right? There's no way to even describe the plots of any of the sequels. Uh, they're, they, I mean, when you get to the Ravager, which is the last one they made, I guess in 2016 or so, yeah. uh, that one apparently was, Cobbled together from stuff that was shot for a web series that they were planning to do. And I defy anybody to explain the plot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also, they shifted in the sequels from a focus on Mike. And I always think that the vulnerable character, the innocent character, is the best person to stick with because everything looks challenging and menacing to that person. Yeah. And that's perfect for a horror movie. Instead, they decide, uh, possibly because the uh, the, well, in the case of Universal, they didn't want to use the original actor. Yeah, so they brought they yeah brought another guy in. So right away we have a, uh, a continuity lapse between the first movie and the second movie. Yeah. I mean, I like I like the second movie, 
but that replacing that actor just it's too jarring <laughs> you're yeah. just because it's almost like you're watching it and you're not watching the same story it's too jarring to see right. the original yeah. actor and now the new the new actor and and also he's a completely different type of person i mean the, yeah. the, the first uh, guy at that age he was sort of perfect representation of an adolescent yeah uh and he, he seemed completely uh uh, vulnerable to the to the problems of the world, right? Uh, skinny little kid. Uh, then when they do the second one, they have this sort of uh, uh, you know, I guess Universal was the one that insisted on using him. Now he might be a talented actor. I haven't seen him in anything else. I understand he went on and did some other films, but he's more like the the sort of uh, hunky guy that you might yeah. see in a, on a, a WB show, or you know, just a completely different type of person. And also not convincing as a sort of vulnerable yeah. person that's sort of grappling with the world. Yeah, well, I mean, in part two, they start, that's when it turns into an action film. Yes, yeah. They do the, they go into the hardware store, commando style, and put together all the weapons and the right. four-barrel shotgun and the flamethrowers right. and stuff. So it kind so of they, takes away from the charm uh, of the original one. <laughs> I, I would say so. I mean, I know a lot of people, there are some people that actually prefer the second one. I, I was speaking to a friend the other night and he says he th enjoyed the second one, I guess because it came along at a time in his life when somehow he could relate to what they were doing in that film. Yeah. Uh, like I said, that scene reminded me of the scene from Commando with Arnold Schwarzenegger where he yeah. breaks into a sur army surplus store and is getting like all the weapons. <laughs> right. And in, in Commando, they do it in Dawn of the Dead. Dead, you know? yeah. There's a, a bunch of movies where yeah, that scene of them, everybody's suiting up. <laughs> yeah. uh, but also, uh, it would seem that they're thinking of trying to reposition Reggie's character as a sort of uh, Bruce Campbell character. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the shotgun and all that sort of stuff. And, the, uh, and you know, he, he's an entertaining screen presence. It's fun to watch mm -hmm. him in the sequels. And, and with some of the sequels, he's not the only thing that's really Yeah, fun. I like one and three, I guess, are my favorites. Three was just... I know it was, you know, they still had the, you know, a lot of the action stuff, but it was, it seemed more fun than what right. part two did. Yeah. Part two might be an instance where they actually had too much money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, was too, uh, the first film had a certain amount of uh, special effects work, but it was very rudimentary stuff, you know, and it's more fun because it's so simple. Uh, and then the second one is like a lot of prosthetic makeup effects and things like that. And it just becomes a special effects, uh, festival you know yeah rubbery special effects wherever you, know, you look uh my friend was particularly impressed with the idea of these towns being decimated as the tall man goes from place to yeah. place and i suppose that's an interesting idea i think the problem for me is that uh the more you try to make these sort of dream like things in the first film seem convincing by coming up with explanations the more that weighs the whole thing down, it becomes yeah. like a chore to watch, you know. Once they got into the, I guess it was Oblivion, where they try to do a backstory of the tall man, and right. I'm just like, oh, come on, right. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> yeah, it, it, so it takes away some of the mystery of that character. Yeah, uh, the mystique I, and the, you know, it's just, I want, I just want to know that he's some from some red planet, and I don't. Yeah, that's all I need to know. Right. <laughs> and he you turns don't... humans into little Jawas. <laughs> <You're... laughs> right. <laughs> the other problem with the sequels is they, uh, and this is also something, this is similar to the Jaws syndrome. <laughs> right? You start with a film where everything happens randomly. The people who are affected just happen to be there when the shark attacks, right? And then as the movies go on, we are supposed to believe that shock is carrying a garage. Sure, yeah. Seeking out <laughs> Chief Brody's <laughs> wife and children. Following him, following him to the Bahamas. Which is preposterous, <laughs> right? And the same thing happens in this film. It's, it's less preposterous because the whole thing is kind of preposterous. So, uh, But the idea that the tall man begins to develop a, a special interest in Mike and, and Jody and Reggie, like those become his great uh, uh, nemesis is if there is such a word, uh, that it, that sort of strains credibility, you know. The tendency to go for the idea that Reggie is some sort of perpetual lech. Yeah. You know, that he, he's <clears throat> hitting on every girl that he meets all through the sequels. <laughs> yeah. You know, and never, never achieving success, right? He doesn't get laid uh, at once, I, I don't think. You're right. But uh, the role of women in the sequels is less 
uh, excusable because uh, they've moved away from the idea in the first film that this is just a fantasy in a small boy's mind. Yeah. You know, when you look at the women in the first film, they don't really register very much, right? And you have the, the lady in lavender, who is, I guess, just the, the tall man in disguise. And you have uh, the daughter, the granddaughter of the fortune teller and the fortune teller, two other women, uh, and they don't really amount to much in the story. And you have the two girls that show up who are supposedly running a, the antique shop that, and they're friends of Jody, supposedly. Right. Uh, that's another instance where editing probably makes sort of truncates things in a sort of uh, uh, uncomfortable way or sloppy way that you just suddenly sending Mike off to stay with these two people that we haven't been introduced to. And you just get a couple of lines of dialogue to establish that they're running an antique shop. And five, six minutes later, they're gone from the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, probably the most awkward thing is when Reggie has to explain how he found them and freed them from the mausoleum. <laughs> uh, we don't see any of that. That's all been cut out if it was ever shot. And he makes the very unfortunate remark of saying uh, they took off into the woods like scared rabbits, uh, which is, this seems like a strange thing to say, right? I mean, why would you be surprised that two women that have gone through that sort of extraordinary ordeal would be scared? Right? Yeah. The one great asset that this series had, all the movies, Angus Scrim is terrific. Yeah. I mean, he is a delight to watch. <laughs> it would, it, there's so many instances in horror movies, particularly with the franchises that have been coming out since phantasm was first done there's so many franchises where uh people become stars by playing sort of vast characters that never have to do anything <laughs> yeah. stay up people or you know uh, and this is an instance where hey guy's a really good actor for the for at least for the role he's playing oh yeah he has it down and his voice and his delivery is so perfect every it's the notes just perfectly uh, he is uh, the re possibly the only real reason to watch Ravager, the last one. Our paths cross again. And apparently he was ill at the yeah, time. Yeah, but I don't, I, I'm, well, I'm trying to remember if he even got to finish it before he died. Well, they, they, I think they shot most of the stuff like this, and then they just mm -hmm. sort of stuck his head on, on oh, okay. uh, bodies at different moments in the film. Uh, the interesting thing, as they went along, they gave him more and more dialogue. Yeah. Which is understandable, because he really handled the dialogue well. Uh, by the last one, you know, you got to say, gee, what a trooper, even at 89, still willing, even though he, I guess he couldn't travel, still willing to you know, allow them to make them up and, and do the scenes, do the dialogue. So it's worth seeing for that reason. I noticed again, uh, funeral scene, people in the, in the group holding, uh, holding umbrellas. Yeah. You know, you know it didn't appear to be raining. <laughs> That's uh, something we see in a lot of movies when they do funeral scenes. Uh, God bless Dan Curtis. When he did a funeral scene, I guess it was in House of Dark Shadows. And he called in the local fire department and they just <laughs> rained a torrent of water on the people. They look like they're drowning in the water. <laughs> That's the way to do a funeral scene. Righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I noticed uh, in the first one, they have this reflective sphere flying around. I didn't see the camera or a crew member, not one time. In the later films, they kind of slacked off of that, and I started noticing stage lights. And so I was just like, I don't, I don't know how they done it in the first one. I don't know how they done it without getting the. Are they hiding the camera behind something? Are they, you know, what I'm saying, are they filming? Is the camera behind a wall somewhere? I don't know how they're keeping the camera out of that. Because I know they didn't go back in and digitally remove it. <laughs> oh no, no, and most of the effects are, are pretty pretty fun even if they're not completely convincing uh you know the it's not the greatest bug in the world in a way it, maybe it being kind of a crappy looking bug 
uh, makes it that much more enjoyable. It looks like something you might uh, have bought in a, in a toy store. You know? Yeah, it remind me of something you'd see in a William Castle movie. Oh, in a William Castle movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a William Castle shop for all his props in the toy store. <laughs> and the, uh, the finger in the box, of course. Uh, I saw somebody on, on the IMDb saying that they saw the stick that was attached to the finger uh, that, to make it move. To make it move. Okay, I believe you. It's pretty obviously not a real finger. Yeah. Uh, but, but all of these things don't really, from, from my perspective, they don't uh, damage the movie at all. Because, yeah, it doesn't take anything away from it. Right. I mean, a, a boy that age, probably his only experience with dismembered body parts would be with toys that he bought, you know, Halloween right, things yeah. and stuff like that. So that's probably what he would think a, a, a dismembered finger would look like. Uh, you know, it, it just adds to the fun. I've always been of the feeling that when you're doing <clears throat> gore effects or stuff like that, that achieving complete realism isn't necessarily the right thing to do for some movies. Right. If, if your movie is supposed to be entertaining and, and not disturbing, then going with really convincing and really accurate uh, gore effects uh, can sort of be, you know, off-putting. At least that's my feeling. I, you know, I'm, I might be alone in that. I think the yellow, I guess, blood right. <laughs> looked way more disgusting than, <laughs> than oh, that's real That's true, blood. yeah, that's true. It was thick and pasty looking, looked like baby food. <laughs> right, yes, and it probably was. Yeah. <laughs> Cascarelli apparently also cited Dario Argento's Suspiria as a source mm -hmm. of inspiration. You could sort of see that as well, not just because of the music, which has a similar quality to it, the goblin music, but also the sort of inexplicable dreamlike quality of the story, you know, where nothing really is explained satisfactorily. And surprisingly, it doesn't really damage the movie. You know, it would actually be a lesser movie if it was thoroughly or properly explained. Uh, so it shares that sort of dreamlike uh, feeling and effect with uh, Argento's films. I, I think what happens with Argen what happened with Argento and probably what happened with the sequels to Phantasm is that there are a lot of things that uh, fans might be willing to forgive in the first film as far as lapses of logic and the plot or you know weak, weak effects and things like that. But as when the film becomes an enormous success and they start doing sequels, then everybody's standards start to go up. Yeah. And just like with Dario Argento doing his Dracula thing, uh, and people look at it and say, what the fuck is that? <laughs> All the little things that people might have found very charming in his earlier films and did find charming and entertaining, suddenly, now that there's uh, such high expectations, you know, and he's considered the master of horror films, and he's doing like uh, Dracula turning into a praying mantis and things like yeah. that. And that, that stuff just doesn't fly anymore. Those sort of uh, weird things that you might come up with and try are going to end up disappointing the fans because they have invested so much of themselves in, the, in their fandom of this franchise that they want the thing to be, you know, really tight and smart and effective. Yeah, and, a lot of bad CGI in that movie, too. And the, his Dracula. The Dracula, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and it just, I mean... You think of you think of his movies. You think of you know practical, you know practical effects, and then he tries to do this, and it's just horrible. You know, in this in the this one or the let's I'll say the first three sequels, the first two sequels, the fact that they're using the real sphere and you know filming it and not getting camera in it and crew members in it, right. and then you get to the last one and it's all CGI and it's just eh. Yeah, it's, it doesn't, have the it doesn't same look part. as good, and it's not as impressive because <laughs> it's. Well, yeah. I felt sorry for the fellow that uh, directed it. I think uh, the last one, um, I think he was also the, the CGI uh, artist on it, mm -hmm. and I know that a lot of you know how the, the critics and the fans online, everybody's an expert. You know. Yeah, and, yeah. And everybody knows the mark <laughs> quality when it comes to CGI. Uh, in my eyes, it didn't look terrible. It's just that it looked like CGI. Yeah, you know, uh, it wasn't any. It wasn't embarrassing. Uh, it was, you know, there are a lot of other movies where that would be would, would have been considered perfectly acceptable. Uh, but in this instance, you have the earlier film to compare it to, and that's the problem. Right? Uh, the the orb or the sphere is not 
that impressive an idea, it's how they did it in the first movie. Yeah. That's, that's why it's exciting, because it looks like it's actually there flying across the set. <laughs> and I guess it was to a certain extent, right? They were actually swinging a ball on a fish, fish line, uh, at least in some yeah. of the shots. So. Or, you know, filming in the reverse shots whenever it's flying into somebody's head. Right. I got to pull it off of them and <laughs> film it back, you know, roll the film backwards. And, yeah. and but it you know, still, I mean, you can tell whenever they do reverse filming, but it's still, it's something about it. Yeah, it's 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 more impressive because <clears throat> something was actually done on the set. And, yeah, uh, that's another problem with the, with the sequels is that they they make the mistake of thinking that just because people liked the sphere hitting the head in the first film, we're going to see that over and over and over, over and over again. again. Yeah, and there's really only so much mileage you can get out of something like that. You know, uh, but uh, but anyway, I, I admire the effort. I know that the the sequels were beyond the universal one. The sequels that were not big budget affairs, uh, so I, you know, I always have respect and admiration for folks that are doing movies on modest budgets and creating some pretty entertaining stuff. You know, some memorable moments from some of the sequels. Uh, I think now that Angus Grimm has passed away, uh, hopefully they won't try to do try another to make one. yeah make another one yeah. And I suppose you could reboot the whole thing, which I guess would be the only way to do it. But maybe they should just let it leave it be. Let it go, yeah. yeah. I guess J.J. Abrams was responsible for getting the film remastered. Uh, he, he apparently was a fan of the movie. He actually named one of the characters in one of the Star Wars movies after yeah, Phantasm. Captain, Captain Phasma. Right. So he was responsible for getting uh, like a 4K restoration done. Yeah, I was going to say, when I watched the first one, rewatched it today, it had the Bad Robot logo at the beginning. I was like, oh, that's oh. weird. <laughs> so. uh, where did you see it? Oh, no, the Peacock Network. Peacock, Peacock. Network. Peacock, Peacock their streaming app. Well, the version I have, uh, I, I don't know exactly if this is the latest version, but it looks terrific to me. It certainly looks much better than the versions that we saw over the years, from VHS and mm -hmm. even some of the DVDs. It's a well-shot movie for a low-budget movie. Um, oh, yeah, it looks great. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering if he had like a, because a lot of the stunts seemed like that the, the actors were just doing their own stunts. Yeah, uh, right. when he breaks the bike, I was like, "That's that's the character." Uh, I'm not for sure. I'm when he breaks out of the room with the uh, shotgun shell and the hammer. <laughs> yes, I'm like, did he really do that, or is that you know what I'm saying? Like, so I just wonder. Didn't seem like there was a lot of OSHA people in the set. <laughs> By the time he had done Phantasm, he actually had done two other feature films. He did uh, Jim, the World's Greatest, and Kenny and Company. Both of them apparently were released. Uh, in 76 uh so he was was a pretty experienced fellow I, whenever i watch it i keep forgetting that it was 76 77 mm -hmm. you know it has that early 80s look and feel to it for some reason the hairstyles are probably the strongest indication of the time period yeah uh, but uh yeah i could see what well, probably what the what, what happened was there were a lot of movies in the 80s that were influenced by phantasm probably yeah so, so that's why you get that feeling that i guess the where i guess the weirdest outfit is the uh reggie and his ice cream <laughs> <laughs> ice cream truck outfit is probably the weirdest yes uh he got, he got the sideburns and a ponytail i guess and uh does he have a ponytail in the first film i think, I think so yeah yeah and he's got a bald head and uh and uh he's Got black socks and, and sneakers on and the ice cream costume. It's quite a good yeah. <laughs> I always took him to be so sort of like a, a past his prime hippie character. Yeah. Well, well I figured they're, they're, they're field musicians still yeah. hanging around town, probably playing at the cantina <laughs> on the weekends. <laughs> well, that, that scene of them sort of sitting on the porch, plucking away on their guitars. There's so many people online that say that that's a favorite scene of theirs from the film. Yeah. And I've been sitting here till noon. So I guess it's just something about those characters. That it reflects something that people have experienced themselves. They, they know people like that, or they are people like that themselves. And so they have more affection for the movie as a result. And that's probably a lesson that we should learn about these films that you can really get a lot of goodwill from the audience if you just show a world that they recognize on the screen yeah. show people that they 
can sympathize with, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I never wore all white like that, but I, <laughs> I have sat around and played guitar with other people. So. And the scene is really, when you stop and think about it, it does, isn't an important scene in terms of the plot. No. But it is important in terms of winning the audience over to, to liking these characters and understanding them. Uh, once you see that scene, you pretty much know who Reggie is and you understand their friendship better. Right? Yeah. Although that one line where he says, uh, we're as hot as love is the actual line. I made, yeah. a, no I made a note of that. <laughs> he's, a, uh, he's a hippie. So these are the sort of things hippies say. Uh, Mike is eating a Tootsie Pop as he walks down the street. So there he's, uh, Coscarelli, I assume, is trying to emphasize the fact that he's still a kid. Uh, and uh, that's important in establishing that, you know. I mean, you have Angus Grimm actually calling him a boy. A boy, yeah. But he, he really is a boy, and I think that's <laughs> yeah, important to establish. And that's why, the as I mentioned, to me, that's why the first film works so much better than the, uh, than the sequel. Yeah. In contrast, though, you have later when he runs, I guess, I can't remember what happened, but he runs home and his brother's there and he sets down on his brother's lap and takes, takes a, a swig, swig of beer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's the so thing. He, so it, now, now he's growing. He's growing as yes, a character. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the thing. You're, you're seeing him sort of uh, slowly uh, coming to terms with all these adult things. Like, for instance, he's uh, uh, fixing the car, right? He's mm -hmm. drive, driving his brother's car at one point. Uh, he's uh, obviously expressing an interest in women, right? He, he uh, reacts very favorably to the sight of uh, the woman's breasts when, her, yeah. when, when his brother is making out with her. Although I don't know how he could have seen a breast. I don't know how he's seen it either, yeah. <laughs> but, but still, it's a reaction shot that's worth having in the film. So I'm glad they did that. I don't know if it was intentional. But the relationship between Barnabas Collins and David, the little boy in the Dark Shadow series, is similar to the relationship that uh, Mike has with the tall man. There's scenes in the old Dark Shadows TV show, not so much in the movie, but in the TV show, right. uh, of Barnabas sort of towering over David and sort of intimidating him. <laughs> And of course, the whole idea that David finds out, he figures out that Barnabas is a vampire and he has that secret. He knows that secret and nobody will believe him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Barnabas keeps showing up and sort of menacing him. Uh, that's sort of similar to what we see in Phantasm. I don't know if that was intentional. I mean, I'm going to guess that Don Cascarelli probably saw Dark Shadows under his arm. Uh, I don't know if he was a big horror fan, but uh, it would have been easy to have seen that and sort of absorb it and say, oh, yeah, that's an interesting thing. A boy confronting this menacing adult. Right. It's kind of a dramatic thing. So, uh, But that idea of a kid who's sort of sneaking around the edges of things and accidentally witnesses something that reveals some secret. That's something that we've seen in a lot of movies, and it's always an yeah. effective thing, right? Because we can always sympathize with somebody like that. Mm -hmm. He sees something he shouldn't have seen. Well, what a what a secret, right? To find out yeah. that, you, that your parents uh, have been shrunk down <laughs> into, into dwarfs. <laughs> well, nothing too is like, who's going to believe me if I tell them this, right? right, right. I've seen something so fantastical that no one's going to believe me, so I'll just keep it to myself. Right. Yes. You know, everybody goes through that, I guess, and in, in you know some weird ways. Right. A kid would be right to assume that no adult is going to believe a story like that. Right? Although in the movie, his brother is fairly easily convinced, and so is Reggie. Uh, though I can't blame them for being convinced. If I, yeah. would, I would be convinced, too, if I saw a moving finger in a box. Finger and then a... <clears throat> of course, I guess Reggie didn't actually see the fly. Well, he's knocked down in that scene. So yeah. they're, they're struggling with it in, in their coat. Yeah. That's kind of an easy way to do a special. Well, actually, he does. He does because they get it in there and it comes back out. Comes of, back out, right? Yeah. You know, so he gets he gets to see enough of it to know. And I think it, I think at that he actually says at that point, "Okay, I'm in." Right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so almost guys, immediately. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very easy to win over. I don't know what I just saw, but let's go. <laughs> I'm yes. with you. Yeah. A lot of good slow motion scenes too, like the tall man walking in slow motion, and he stops when the. I'm assuming he doesn't like cold or he's attracted to cold. I can't remember what it was, but he's yeah. like smelling the <laughs> the ice cream truck when the doors open. Just that, those are great scenes. 
Uh, and actually, it doesn't pay off in the first film, right? Right. There's, yeah. there's nothing in the first film that would suggest what's going on there. We just have that scene. It's a very memorable scene. In the sequels, they decide that cold is bad for him. Yeah. Uh, but in that scene, it almost looks like he's enjoying the. Uh, yeah, but I couldn't. Yeah, but I didn't know if it was that or if he was actually just looking at Mike across the street. I think the way really the scene plays tell, out. Yeah. At first, Mike thinks that he is looking at him, he backs right. away. But then you realize that he's just sort of uh, reacting to the vapor from the yeah, dry from ice. The, yeah. Uh, so I think that my interpretation was that uh, that whatever chemicals in dry ice, when it creates a vapor, that's something that he likes. That's something yeah. that reminds him of home. Angus Grimm was an extraordinary looking person. You know? Oh, yeah. He was a weird-looking, uh, scary-looking guy. One of the better villains in horror movies. And it's really unfortunate. I know he did other movies, but yeah, uh, it seems to me when you give a performance like The Tall Man, uh, you really should have been able to get a lot of other roles in horror films. You know, you should have been like a Christopher Lee or a Boris Karloff or somebody yeah. like that. And I don't think he ever quite achieved that. Maybe he didn't want to. I mean, it might be that he, he seems... He wrote the foreword for a book uh, that I got on Kindle. Uh, it's called Phantasm Exhumed. It's written by a fellow by the name of Dustin McNeil. And the first book covers, I think, all the Phantasm movies. It goes pretty in-depth. And the introduction to the first book is written by Angus Scrim. And from reading the introduction, uh, he seems like a very intelligent guy. Yeah. Par apparently, he was a writer. And his job was to write the liner notes for classical classical music albums hmm. that was his day job yeah. right? writing the liner notes for albums of classical music but you can tell he's a smart guy and maybe that's what his real interest maybe yeah he could be acting as a sideline well I, I figure once you get so big like, you know once two or three of the movies come out and that's what he's known for if anybody's going to put him in a movie they're going to have him playing the same character probably yeah. And if you don't put him in makeup, you're just going to be watching and going, oh, it's a tall man. <laughs> so right. it's probably probably hard to find other roles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, 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 it would be a challenge, especially since they don't make movies like Phantasm that often. Yeah. So they probably find themselves in more pedestrian horror movies where, you know, it doesn't give them the same opportunity. And he could, he could bring a certain flair to this character because it, there was a certain theatricality to it right. uh, that you probably wouldn't be able to get in another movie. Anyway, he, he, this fa fellow wrote two books, Phantasm Exhumed, and I think the other one is Phantasm Exhumed Again. But I recommend them. I read them, even though I didn't much care for the sequels. You know, they're still fascinating to read about uh, how the movies were made and the yeah. difficulties that they went through. And uh, I know Don Coscarelli also wrote a book, uh, which I haven't acquired yet. I'm waiting for the prices to come down a little bit. <laughs> uh, but that should be an interesting story, too, because not only did he do... Phantasm and it's and some most of its sequels, but he also did the Beastmaster and uh, uh, Bubba Bubba Hotep or whatever. Yeah, uh, and also John dies at the end, and uh, uh, you know he's a talented fellow. He's probably got a lot of stories to tell, and he's a smart guy. I've seen him interviewed, so I'm looking forward to reading that. Yeah, I was looking to see if. Uh... <clears throat> Angus had played uh, Frankenstein in anything. He, had, he did not. He did play Abraham Lincoln, though, so that would have oh, been okay. fitting. <laughs> yes, I could see him as it. Was it a, yeah. a, a stage production? Or? It just says it was a short, I guess, like a short, oh, short. film. It was from 1951. So, oh. Yeah, he, I think he would have been a pretty good Frankenstein. Yeah, I could see him. Uh, I mean, he, uh, like Frankenstein's monster in the Boris Karloff movies, he has the platform shoes that he's yep. <laughs> I, I suppose, given the fact that he was able to handle dialogue, which a lot of times the heavies in horror movies are not really able to han handle the dialogue, Yeah, that he was a literate, intelligent fellow and a good actor meant that he probably could have played a wide range of different roles, you know, <clears throat> and not, not just have been limited to... Uh, saying boy yeah in the sequels like i say one of the advantages is that he gets a lot more dialogue so you know and it's always a pleasure to see him uh on the screen he, he knows how to he knows how to deliver that that uh, melodramatic villainous dialogue it's a lost art i think you know? oh yeah there aren't too many actors that could do that convincingly anymore
Well, he'd he done other stuff. He had a recurring role on Alias, the TV show. Well, there's the J.J. Abrams connection. Yeah, so he played on there. He was in the John Dies at the end. Ah, okay. Which so. was on the other, yeah, so... I guess he started doing some of the B-movies also, Dances with the Werewolves in 2017. Well, th to that extent, he uh, he's similar to uh, Reggie. Apparently, he is, his wife is a special effects artist. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, apparently in Phantasm, it was Coscarelli's mother that did some of the special effects, which is kind of interesting. I believe so, yeah. Uh, but uh, Reggie, what's his name, Bannister? Is that Bannister, yeah. yeah. Uh, his wife is a special effects artist, and apparently they present themselves as a kind of a team to uh, indie horror films. Indie horror films, yeah. And I guess he's turned out quite a few of those. Over yeah, he was in. I've seen a couple of them he's in. Are any but of them? None of them really stand out. No. Well, one of them was called. We actually, I think we actually covered one of them on here. It was a bloody, bloody Bible camp. <laughs> oh. Well. It was him and Ron Jeremy was in it. Yeah, it wasn't really good. <laughs> what a team. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, people have to make a living. And I guess oh, yeah. trading on the success of Phantasm makes sense. <laughs> Uh, and I guess it is a bargain for the filmmakers if you can hire a guy who has a reputation as a sort of a cult icon. And yeah, and you movies. can put his picture on the poster and okay. you give him top billing and everybody's going to see it just for that. Uh, in a way, I'm surprised we don't see him in more movies. I know he's yeah, probably, <laughs> probably in his 70s now. I mean, yeah. Right? So maybe he's slowing down a little bit. Uh, and I guess he really, his main career is music. Uh, that's right. true of the fellow that played Jody as well. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but, uh, yeah, it's surprising that he's not doing more stuff. Uh, you, you would think that would be quick, uh, quick money that he could pick yeah. up. Yeah, I figure he's probably, he may be doing a lot of conventions also. Maybe doing the convention circuit. Uh, the uh, problem with the, fan, with the Phantasm franchise, uh, as far as, you know, building a career on it, it is kind of like a, a, a niche uh, audience for it. I yeah. mean, it has a small but what intensely loyal following um but it, it never really been like a mega blockbuster uh, i mean the first film was not as big a hit as halloween obviously and the sequels have all been fairly disappointing at the box office right uh universal apparently decided on the basis of the poor or disappointing returns on phantasm 2 not to fa finance the third film they they distributed it apparently, but they didn't, didn't want to put any more money into it. And they uh, just could they just didn't realize that it was their fault <laughs> that the second one was so bad. I mean, obviously they were telling them who they could hire and who they couldn't hire, you know what I'm saying? So it's just like, and then it bombs and you're going to act like <laughs> it was the movie's fault. <laughs> one of the reasons why low budget movies like that are uh, so memorable is because they have that low budget feel. There's, there's a quality to, uh, that the films have as a result of being done cheaply. Yeah. Uh, we talked about this as far as like regional films like Bloodbeat. Uh, the only thing that really makes that movie worth watching is the fact that it, it was done on a tiny budget by real people in real <laughs> places, you know? Yeah. And it would, it, the script would have been worthless if it had been done for like a couple of million dollars by name <laughs> actors. And yeah. all, you know, that just wouldn't have had any effect at all. Uh, it's almost like going through a family album or watching home movies. Yeah. Uh, I know it, that doesn't sound appealing, but sometimes it can be appealing because we see ourselves in that, you know. And if you're a person who has any aspirations of make, being a filmmaker yourself, it's always interesting to see what other people are able to do on you know, a modest budget. But yeah. The first film has a following that is dedicated and enthusiastic about it, beyond the actual merits of the film which is, yeah <laughs> which is that's that's a neat trick if you can make something that hits people that way you know that's the dream i guess of every oh, yeah. filmmaker is to find something that people will love no matter how flawed it is you know i recommend anybody i mean the first one i guess watch the second one just because it continues the storyline but with a different actor it just it throws me off too much i can't enjoy it part three i really liked just the Reggie character was really good in it. Yeah. The fact that it was, you know, they were trying to do something, you know, not different, but it's just that one character moving on and teaming up with other people that made it good. Uh, the rest of them, I, unless you're just interested in where they go with the story and you care about the tall man's backstory, if you're not, 
then <laughs> don't, don't even bother with the rest of them. I felt an obligation to get through. Once All I got them. Yeah. Once, I, once I got the three, I said, "Well, I got to go through and finish." <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, and uh, there were memorable moments. Uh, yeah. in, in each one of the films. Where can everybody find your movies at? Well, uh, Demon Resurrections on <clears throat> Tubi TV is doing pretty good there, from what I see. Uh, it's also on Amazon Prime Pay Per View. It's uh, on uh, Zumo TV, which is another free with ads platform. My first film, I've just spent the past uh, three years almost <laughs> uh, fiddling around with it, re editing it, uh, uh, up resing it, and uh, just trying to make it into a better movie. Uh, and that is that work has essentially been finished. Uh, I just finished actually doing the score. Which was a real uh, trick for me because I am not a musician. You're right. So, <laughs> there's nothing harder than doing something that you really can't do. You can't do, yeah. Uh, but that's all done, and people can learn about all this stuff uh, on my Facebook page. I have a Facebook page under my name, and I have a Demon Resurrection Facebook page, and a Sleepless Nights uh, Revamped. That's what we're calling it, uh, Sleepless Nights Revamped. Uh, there's a Facebook page and a Twitter account for that, and for Demon Resurrection, and I have a blog. And you know, if you do a Google search for me. You'll probably find me out there somewhere. Thank you again for having me on these things. I guess it's been two years we've been doing these shows now. Right? Seems, I think, yeah, I think it's been That's two years great. since you've been on here. Yep. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to uh, voice my screwy ideas. No, no problem. I enjoy, I enjoy listening to them, enjoy talking to you. And we'll definitely have to do this again. All righty, great. I'll look forward to that. Yep. <laughs>